Anyway, Adam is a member of our co-working space and also a illustrious attorney, and he has uh, a lot of knowledge about how to uh, deal with startups and all the different things that go on when you're growing and building and raising money and all that kind of stuff. And this is your third or second? Third. Third presentation. The other so, ones were intense. This one's like laid back. This would be fantastic. Be, well, we'll see. There's a few people in here that might have you. So, um, anyway. Stick anyway. around for the beginning. So, stick a couple of quick words. All right. <laughs> have fun. Thanks for coming, people. Really appreciate it. Let me just really quick get a tally about uh, people's experience. How many people here have applied for a patent? Uh, uh, one. Excellent. One. Two. How many people here have applied for a trademark? Excellent. Okay. And copyright. Not how many of you have a copyright, because the answer is all of you. The question is how many have registered for copyright? None. One, two, three and a half a person behind the stairs. All right, great. That gives me a, a good perspective. Just a little bit about myself. I actually started as a lawyer in it, uh, litigation for a year with intellectual property litigation. And then went into transactional work. A lot of the licensing of intellectual property, finance, and that sort of stuff. And what I realized in trying to prepare for the talk today is that so many times when I've seen this given by other people, there's such this huge emphasis on patents. It's usually because the person is a part of the patent bar. That's where the majority of the time goes. But I think for most startup companies, uh, although you have to be conversant and understand uh, patents and how they work and what can happen, what the pros and the cons are, and how to describe your own patents, uh, they're not going to be the primary instrument of intellectual property that will help you be successful at the end of the day. Uh, and I thought I'd actually start by, well, one is I had a little quote from the Constitution, which is actually where copyright and patents come from in the United States. So it goes back that far. But uh, my own little war story. So when I went to law school, I actually was really interested in how law that was created way before a lot of the technology we know about would play out once we have all this great new technology. And I was following uh, two cases in graduate school. One was, or I should say a series of cases, one was Apple versus Microsoft. Apple was suing Microsoft for the graphical user interface, the Windows and all the cool things that the Windows did. And the other one was that Intel was suing the bejesus out of AMD, who was suing the bejesus out of Intel back. And that was a much larger, much more complex suite of lawsuits all over the United States um, and some internationally. But I was following these both. They were very interesting because they were asking questions about exactly how does this all work when it comes to technology. And funny enough, these cases didn't focus, at least the core of them, and the power of them very often didn't focus on patents focused more on copyrights and trademarks. Um, and I was lucky because when I graduated, I actually was the most junior associate on these cases, both of them. And um, with Apple Music, Microsoft Computers, within a matter of months, we lost after seven years. Um, I don't think I had much to do with it, I'd like to say. And Intel Corp, uh, whereas AMD, I think we settled with it about nine months after I joined again. I don't think there's any responsibility that I can take. Um, nor did I get a big amount of the fees. Apple, ver Apple versus Microsoft was a really cool case. The reason being, I'm gonna plug this in, I think, because apparently it goes to sleep if I don't. Um, because what it was, was it, our, our, we know that copyright protects authorship, paintings, what have you, but can it protect the elements of graphical user interface? And can it actually protect the entire look and feel of graphical user interface? And the answer is, we got it sometimes? No, no, almost never, maybe, maybe under some small circumstance was the answer. And um, Apple actually lost again, not I think because I joined as a junior associate in the seventh year, although it could be, some could draw that conclusion. But because, number one, the court said, look, first of all, we think that what you bring to bear was an original. You say that, yes, Microsoft took your stuff, but actually it looks like out of the 160 elements, that you've said they ripped you off, they ripped, ripped off you. A lot of these came from Xerox. So you don't actually have the standing to assert that these were your original works. Okay? Then a whole bunch of the other elements, it turns out, look, how many different ways can you possibly show a printer? And copyright is not supposed to protect functional items. And because of that, we're not, because there's only a couple of ways to show a printer, we can't, we can't give you the idea of a printer, graphical user interface. Okay? When you click on it, that's the printer, we can't do that. And so literally almost 
every single element of the graphical user interface was obliterated by the court. And although there was, and that's a, by the Ninth Circuit finally after seven years, there was a very similar case on the East Coast, which was uh, brought by Lotus. Very similar conclusion because it turned out that copyright, even though Congress said, yeah, you know, we do want it to protect software, when you got right into it and started to analyze it, copyright law didn't really apply very well. And that's still, still good law. And we'll talk a little bit more about how it might express itself and what you're trying to do. Intel versus AMD Micro, there were patents and whatnot. What was interesting is, is there's something called microcode. Show of hands, anybody that knows microcodes and CPUs? Two. The, uh, the way it works, there's little separate processing units that you have on your computers and phones and everything else. They've got code inside, let's just call it microcode. And what AMD did, and a lot of other companies did, is they said, we want to work with Intel, so we have to be compatible. But we, can't, we know we can't copy the code. That would be a copyright infringement. So what we'll do is we'll actually send some people into a room, sequester them completely, have them develop the, the, some code by looking at your code, like Intel's code, they'll develop their own code and it will be different, okay? And it gets a little bit more complex with this, but at the end of the day, they develop code, and I, I, I actually, it's a lot more complicated than that. Point is, they develop something, you leave none of the original code. None, that's very important. And now you've developed your own code that actually can plug in and be compatible with Intel. If you do this successfully, you won't be infringing because you actually haven't copied anything at the end of the day. You have. The problem was, and the reason why we won on this piece of the litigation was, the Intel engineers that were doing all, I'm sorry, the AMD engineers that were doing all of this, there was a bunch of code that didn't do anything and a bunch of comments that didn't make any sense. So they just left it. Well, it turns out that the microcode, they changed. But that stuff, they didn't change, and that they had copied, and that was a copyright infringement. That's how, that's how weird it was at that point, in terms of that, but where, where Intel really hoped it, and would have had a huge and tremendous effect on AMD and the marketplace in general, is AMD found it absolutely necessary, as did NEC at the time, to call their chips 386 compatible, and to call the chips 386 chips, more or less. And what they said is, Intel said, oh wait, this is our trademark, and AMD said, you can't call this a trademark, it's a bunch of numbers, it's used to identify a certain kind of workability of this, of the, of the, of this machine. Um, and the court actually ended up agreeing with AMD that basically this term had become generic, that even though Intel completely coined it, completely, it was fanciful, it didn't really mean anything at this point, it was just 386, the game before was 286, the game coming next was 486. But the bottom line is they let the entire industry just start using that 86 moniker. And because of that, it become descriptive or generic as to that specific functionality. And it no longer really identified Intel. And this is going to relate somehow to what you guys are doing, I promise you. No longer really relates to Intel. And therefore, AMD, they don't get to enforce that. Intel doesn't get to enforce that trademark against you. And so AMD and other people said, oh great, now we got a 386 chip, now we got a 486 chip. Intel's response was, I wrote it down, you might remember this, Intel Inside, a brilliant marketing strategy that I myself thought would never ever work. The idea of telling consumers, it's got Intel Inside, forget this 386 stuff. Intel Inside, I don't even know what it means. Nobody knows what it means, it doesn't matter. People bought it up, they'd go to uh, all the stores and they'd say, great, but does this have Intel Inside? Well, it's got a 386 from AMD, yeah, but does it have Intel Inside? And that worked. And I think the big message here is that sometimes the most expensive intellectual property that you can get with the most expensive lawyers that you can get, with the most complicated tech, isn't gonna help you nearly as much as a marketing strategy that works and making sure that you try to cover that to a certain degree with intellectual property. If Intel would have known, nobody in the world knew how this was gonna result because the nature of this technology and this marketplace was too new. Had they known how this would have worked, had they implemented this, something like this earlier, they would have killed off AMD probably entirely. There's a good bet to have. Or at least there would have been a very interesting marketplace war about it. And so with that in mind, I'm going to de-emphasize, you know, some of the importance of patents and explain why, but also how many people know about design patents or are pretty familiar with them, for instance. Okay, so I'm, I'm, we're going to talk, about, I'm going to try and take the time and actually focus on that a little bit more, because my guess is, okay, let me ask another question. How many people are you, uh, how many people here are involved in a startup company of some kind? Pretty widespread. Of those, how many do you need, would I need an engineering degree in order to develop, help develop the product? Okay, that's helpful. 
So in other words, you guys aren't building ships in most cases, maybe. And I'd love to talk to the people. Let, actually, let's go ahead and find out what, what kind of product is it or service, like if I can. Specific? Uh, as, as specific as it can be. Um, converting audio streams into video streams. OK. And then, so in other words, if audio stream comes, it finds a video stream that's appropriate, minds it, brings it down, maybe some transcoding, sure. going around yeah. synchronization. And then, uh, Artificial intelligence powered IVRs, so it's like Siri on your phone instead of your dog, menu based assistant. With Siri on my phone? Uh, Siri on the phone, like when you call a company, you get its own menu. We're replacing that with something smarter like Siri. Got it, got it. So, yeah, there's a SRI spin off of it. We'll talk some time. So, a little bit of harder core. And as you get into the harder core, there's more need for patent. We'll, we'll get more into that for patent strategy. So, let's, let's first, and hopefully, I'm not going. I won't be reviewing too much of what you already know, but we'll find out real quick. First two things that I want to absolutely, what I've done here is made a matrix of different forms of intellectual property and sort of some of the qualities of that intellectual property. And what I first want to do is highlight the difference between patents and trade secrets because these are literally polar opposites. Okay, a trade secret is something that has commercial value because it is secret. Can somebody name something? Coca-Cola. Everybody, Coca-Cola. The, the, supposedly the recipe has been a secret since its inception. They've actually changed it a bit. It is still a secret. How about a, another one? Did I write it down? I didn't write it down. It's really interesting because it's massive. Nobody thinks of it when I mention this. Google's algorithm for search. There's elements of how it searches that are patented, but the actual search algorithms are a complete trade secret. Now what's interesting about trade secrets are, now right now they, that has, can we all agree, that has commercial value because it is a secret, right? If it was no longer secret and everybody could, could use it, then it would have less value to Google, right? Because now, you know, Bing or anybody else can say, hey, you wanna search in a Google kind of way? Here you go, we're using their algorithm. The interesting thing about a trade secret is it's a very fragile thing. The moment that a trade secret gets leaked out, it's done. There's no more trade secret. Coke would have no more trade secret rights in that recipe the moment it gets published. If I'm Coca-Cola or if I'm Google, and for some bizarre reason I did a deal with you, you're a, some kind of ad company, and I have to disclose the algorithm to her in order for the whole thing to work. If she just, for some reason, it's in a briefcase, maybe it's an accident, she falls up, briefcase, how old is this? <laughs> it's on a thumb drive, for some reason BitLocker didn't encrypt it. And she falls down and goes to the hands of a, you know, somebody and it gets published, it is no longer a trade secret. And anybody can do, if it's not covered by some other intellectual property, anybody can do whatever they want with it. Now, there's another problem with trade secrets, and this has been known for a long time. The problem with trade secrets is as long as I'm using it, nobody knows what the hell it is. I mean, Google has a lot of value by keeping this trade secret. Patents were invented very, very much. I don't know if you had a chance to read the quote, very, very much not just because we want you to be successful, but because we want you to disclose what your invention is to the rest of the world. If you disclose it to the rest of the world and allow us to publish it as a government, we will give you a monopoly over that invention. So it's literally the polar opposite. You get the protection by having an appropriate and complete disclosure. And that's what the patent application is, which you can find online whenever anybody applies. So the next piece is, uh, I'm just trying to think, criteria for protection, novel, non-obvious. Um, in other words, the invention has to be novel, it has to be new. There's another step, it's not only does it have to be new, but if I take a look at everything that existed before it, and I mean everything, and I put it all together, would somebody who knows this stuff, an engineer who knows this stuff, would they consider this obvious? Like what you've done here, like an obvious step? Or is it not obvious? Um, and this is called a prior R search. And the thing is, anything counts. If there's a paper in a library that is accessible to the public in Prague, printed, not online, that counts as prior R. So what you often see is that, on one hand, what we do is we gather a bunch of prior art when we do the patent application. But if we actually want to litigate that patent, the defendant will actually send people all over the world, if necessary, in order to find prior art. And if they find that when you aggregate all this, an expert sits down and says, yeah, it seems pretty darn obvious to me, and a jury agrees with that, 
then they have a good defense. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? It's an important point. The reason why it's important is it leads to a major problem. One is it's very expensive to file and prosecute a patent. By the way, prosecuting a patent is what it means in criminal law. Prosecuting a patent means we have the patent application, we give it to the patent office. What happens is we wait. We wait for, let's say, a couple of years. Patent, it's given to an examiner. Examiner sends you a letter. That letter will say 94% of the time your application is rejected um, because it's novel or it's obvious. It's not novel or it's obvious, and there's also these other problems. And you go through it, usually at least a five-year process of trying to convince the examiner why that's not true. And it's very weird. You get these letters, they're all, almost always called final, uh, uh, final, final letters of rejection, even though they're not final at all. And this process goes five years, it can go 18 years, it can go 20, it can go 25 years. It can go a very long time. And so it becomes, yes, it, it may cost you a lot to file it. Not the filing fees, filing fees might be less than $1,000. But not only will it cost you ten dollars to $20,000 perhaps to pay a lawyer, the right lawyer to actually craft this patent for you, it might cost you another ten, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 to actually get it prosecuted until you actually get a patent awarded. By the way, you don't know if it's going to get awarded. And the other problem with patents is, you have no idea what's going to get awarded, when it's going to get awarded, what you're going to finally end up with. Because in, in the process of that examination and prosecution, you're going to give stuff up. So that what ends up being there isn't necessarily what you originally applied for. It's very hard to know what you have. Okay, now you have it. Wonderful, I have a patent. Let's say you've got it. It's only been five years. I'm going to go, I'm going to go after my competition with that patent. You better have a lot of money. Chances are it's going to cost at least, at least a half million dollars, and it could be easily a million dollars to litigate that patent before you ever impanel a jury. In other words, before the trial actually starts, not the cost of the trial, before the trial starts, that's the kind of cost that we're talking about. Um, also, it's going to be very, very difficult to know if somebody's infringing. Now, how hard? Well, maybe if you were an expert, you'd know. Forget about it. In the Apple versus Samsung litigation, which were, and I think, is there, is there anybody that hasn't heard about this litigation? It's a whole bunch of patents going all over the place. They've been suing the bejesus out of each other. Well, that's what's been going on for a few years. Uh, interesting enough, it's um, the head of Apple, general counsel, was the head of uh, Intel's legal department. The general counsel for Apple was formerly the general counsel for Intel, who was formerly my boss back during that first year. So. Um, Interesting, different, same, same people running around. Point being is that uh, you had all these patents, right? And you would think that the world's eyes were on this. A, because it was a sexy case, right? Samsung, iPhone, tablets. You had the entire legal community. People did not know the experts of the world, the top legal experts, had no idea. I mean, we had opinions, but there's no consensus over who was right and whether or not the claims were infringed. Between the way that these patents get drafted and what ultimately happens, you can have a lot of ambiguity, and it only gets settled after years and millions of dollars of litigation. And even then, you don't have, as I said before, any kind of precognition whether or not it's going to work. Well, as a startup company, that's not going to happen, so why should you ever have a patent? Well, one is, looks good. It's kind of nice if you finally get it. You know, in investors who even should know better because they, you probably can't enforce your patent, you probably don't have the money, and if you did have the money, somebody big might defend themselves to the point where you'd never be able to win. But still, it's kind of nice. It's nice to have. Second, vanity. Hey, I got a patent. Third is, and this is the most important one for a startup company, is a defensive posture. There's a legal term for a company that doesn't have a patent portfolio, that is in a competitive market space where its competitors do have a patent portfolio. That term is called a punching bag. Because your competitor comes over, knocks on your door, you open the door, they go, boom, boom, and you don't have a patent. And so you can't punch it back. Um, and when I encourage companies to actually get patents in the field, it's, it's very much, even when it's a highly technical sector, it's very much to have that defensive posture. And what's interesting, I'll just put this out there for you guys that, that have that, is that in that case, what I want you to do, usually, is not so much worry about, does it cover your technology? It should cover your technology. But you are in a special space to see where this technology is going to be four or five years from now when that patent gets granted. 
So we're not going to necessarily draft a patent to cover what you have. It's going to be what you, to cover what you think your competitors are going to have four or five years from now. Because that's going to be one of the main purposes of that patent or set of patents. Um, what's the major benefits? Oppressive and scary. You guys get that, right? Potentially broad rights. Well, when something's ambiguous and big and scary, so it gives you a wide swath of rights and it's swath of rights. And it's supposed to. Also, because it's been, because uh, uh, you might have gotten it back a while ago, um, it ends up being very often you get a broader set of rights than what you thought. Let me give you an example. Uh, the best example I can think of. So, one interesting with, thing with uh, utility patents, which is this, what we're talking about, is that not only do you get the invention, but also if somebody uses your invention to manufacture something else and they don't get a license from you, that secondary product is also infringing your patent. So once upon a time, I think in the 1950s, somebody had this great idea. He said, I know, we need to keep track of things. You know, these parts inside a manufacturing plant. We, need to keep, we don't have a good way of doing this. What if we could just stick a label on it? Stick a label that could easily be read by a machine. And then the machine could figure out what to do with the part. And we'll make it barcode. So he invented something he really didn't invent it called a barcode scanner. You know, the idea of these lines with the little numbers and, the, and a computer can very easily read it. And so it would aid manufacturing. Everybody's familiar with barcodes, I hope, because you've been to the grocery store and whatnot. Well, here's the thing. When there came time, when the patent finally issued, I think it was 18 years later, 20 years later, whatever it was, did the guy go, and his lawyers, did they go to the people that made barcode equipment? Well, they could have. It's not exactly a huge market. They could have gone there. Why do it? They said to themselves, oh, wait a second. What's being manufactured today using barcodes? Anybody know the answer? Everything. Everything. Furniture, cars, home equipment, you name it. And so what they started doing, because the automotive industry right then was a sitting duck, is they went out the automotive industry and started getting well over $100 million in damages. So you really get this incredible swath of rights and capability to sue. If you finally get it, you have the money to litigate, and your patents hold up. And again, comparing to trade secret, trade secret just, it, it's this very limited thing. It is only your use of that trade secret. If somebody comes in and takes your trade secret without authorization and, and uses it or discloses it without your authorization, then you can come after them. But it only hit, you, you're only, your rights have only to do with that trade secret, not somebody else independently coming up with it, not somebody independently using it if they find out about it because she lost her thumb drive. It's, it's literally the polar opposite. But on the other hand, if you want to keep something a secret, not publish it, and use it a lot, like Google search engine, the, the algorithms that control that, it's a, it's a great piece of intellectual property. Um, it's also easy, easy to get, and that you don't actually have to go to a government or anything like that to actually get it. All you have to do is take very, very great care that you keep it a secret. It's one of the reasons why NDAs are so important. If you ever wondered, you probably never heard of a lawsuit with an NDA. It very, very rarely happens. So why do I encourage all my clients to use NDAs upside, left side, right side? Well, one of the reasons is in order to have a trade secret, you have to show the court, if you're ever suing somebody, that you treated that secret in a confidential way. You treated it like a secret. One of the ways of showing that is that you protected it by an NDA whenever you disclosed it with another party. If I go around and, eh, maybe I use an NDA, maybe I don't use an NDA, maybe I broadcast it on TV, I'm not treating it as a secret. And there's, so nobody's going to, uh, and so court isn't going to agree with me that I'm creating commercial value by keeping it a secret and I'm giving it that protection. Um, the other reason, by the way, to use an NDA that's very important is that if you, dis you lose a lot of patent rights, right now internationally, if you disclose, if you merely disclose your invention in an open way. So if I'm here and I have a cool invention, I don't know any guys, especially not under NDA, you don't work for me. I said, I got the coolest invention in the whole world. I figured out how to flip hamburgers just by watching them. It uses a semiconductor from AMD, whatever it is. Just by, if I actually disclose it enough that uh, somebody, not necessarily you, but an engineer who knows this technology would be able to actually create it. I've blown a lot of my, a bit, I've, I've largely blown up my rights to get those patents outside of the United States. Um, the other thing that I'll just note, because it's on my mind and I'll forget it later, is that if you're thinking that you have a patent that you want to file, you had better file it before the 16th of next month. 
patent law changes next month in lots of ways. And one of the ways is it used to be that in the United States, whoever invents the invention first gets the invention. It's called your priority date. So even though I filed a patent, let's say I filed a patent today, if a year ago was when I actually conceived it and I reduced it to what the, the invention, how it works and all that, it's called reduction of practice. I get last year, I get the date from last year when I actually invented it, not when I filed it. The rest of the world was like, this is crazy. They haven't been doing that for a long time. So now what we're doing is we're changing our own patent laws to actually homogenize with international patent law. So if you invented something five months ago or a year ago or six months ago and you file it on March 31st and somebody in France files it, it's an, it, can be, it doesn't have to be that they copied you, but they thought of exactly the same thing, but for some reason they actually file it on March 20th in France, they win. You lose. Um, that's enough. Copyright. I just want to see if I want to cover anything on the second page. If you'll excuse me, I'm doing everything but grabbing a water over here, right? Yeah, I think it's good. So, Um, there's a lot of misunderstandings about copyright, so let's first get, copyright is the oldest form of intellectual property we know. Copyright got started in, I think, 1706 in England under something called the Statute of Anne, um, and it was always for the commercial exploitation of artistic expression. That is always what it was for. It was the idea that, well, publishers, in order to make money, have to have some kind of monopoly over at least that piece of art. And it's grown quite a bit, but it's still largely the same thing, which is, it is an expression in a tangible medium. Okay, an expression, just pretty much what you think. It's a writing, it's a sound, okay, it's a sculpture, whatever. Tangible medium means that it's kind of static. Okay? If I take a stick and I do a beautiful drawing in a river as it flows, if nobody's filming it, there's no copyright. If I film it, that film has a certain tangibility in that. It's not going to change unless I delete it or I alter it. So that film gains copyright by its author. The author is the person that filmed it. When does it get that copyright? Do they have to actually register it? No. Under the Berne Convention, it's been around forever. You don't, the moment that I write it down, the moment I type this form up without putting a C on it or anything, I got copyright to it. Period. For my life to 75 years. So why do we register it? Why do you actually print out a copy? and send it to the copyright office. The reason is, is because you get special statutory damages and they're really, 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 really worthwhile. So let's say you stole this from me, okay? And they consider it original enough that I can go out and sue you. I sue you, you have used this, you've spread it around. Now, great, I win. Now the question comes to damages. I prove my, how my, well, uh -oh. what are my damages? I mean, you're taking this from me, am I really, how am I, well, maybe I don't have as many clients, or I don't have as many. How do I prove damages? What's the money? The nice thing about statutory damages is you no, no longer have to prove your damages. The statute says that, well, look, if they're a willful infringer, you guys knew. I mean, I told you all about copyright. You took it anyway. You came here, and you took it, and you gave it to another law firm, or whoever it was. Then the court can award between $30,000 and $150,000 per work, not per copy, per work. This is a single work. You make a million copies of this, you're a willful infringer, still limited to 30,000 to 150,000. You make one copy of it, but it's one work, 30,000 to 150,000. But that's a lot of money, that's pretty good. This is when you hear about the uh, recording industry going after people and somehow they get $6 billion for what's the first on somebody's hard drive. It's because that one copy of 40,000 songs or whatever it is, you multiply it by somewhere between 30,000 and 150,000. Um, in order to do that, you need to register it, I think it costs $75. If you go to the United States Co Copyright Office, you can see it online. Uh, you register it and also put on your notice, 2013 copyright, name of the entity, or your name if it's personal. Okay? Um, you get protection if it's original. That's all it is. You just didn't take it from somebody else. That's it. Real easy. Not nearly as hard as patents, right? 
um, pretty cheap. One place where it isn't cheap is let's say you guys are developing mobile apps, right? And you're using Scrum because you're cool, you know, the Scrum thing. And Monday meeting, you go, wow, we really did a great rev from last week. And you go, shit, the UI's changed a lot. We better re, you know, uh, register this UI as well, what we're seeing now in terms of the user experience or elements of it back with the copyright office. You start doing this every week for elements, you're racking up dollars. So you gotta be a little bit judicious about this. Um, I said it's automatic unless you want the statutory rights. Goes on for a long, long time. Used to be 14 years with the statute, Dan. And um, ended up being, I think, 24 years for a long time in US history. And now to homogenize with the rest of the world because the rest of the world agreed that we really ought to protect Mickey Mouse for an extended period of time. It's true, by the way, it was one of the major drivers. Life plus 70 work years. Or if it's a work made for hire, i.e. You're in a company, somebody's working for the company, make it for you 95 years from the day of publication. Any questions on copyright? Because I know you guys are probably fairly involved in that. By the way, how's this feeling right now? A little too much, a little too little, boring. Okay. I don't know if I believe you. Trademark, we're going to talk about a lot because. I hear, at least around here, people talk about trademarks a lot, and they really, really don't necessarily have a strong grasp of what they are um, and how to use them. And part of it is, it's, trademarks, especially for technology, become very, very problematic. Because one of the hardest things about getting a trademark is saying, that's the trademark I want, right? And you know, you come up with some great name, and then you give it to your attorney, or you actually go search it online, it turns out there's 20 other people using it, whatever it is. There's just so much commerce, and we see through it so much now with the internet, that it seems like it's hard to get a name. That's why you end up with somebody like Zenga, having a name like Zenga. It means nothing. Which makes it, by the way, a phenomenal, phenomenal trademark. Trademarks have strength, depending on how ridiculous they are. Okay, the better a trademark describes what it is, that the, that product or service is doing, the less enforceable it is. Okay, so at one polar side we have Zenga, right? Where it, I think it was the name of the guy's dog, or so we, he says. It has nothing to do with games. Before Zenga existed as a company, if you said, "Hey, I got a company, Zenga," nobody would go, "Oh, a game company. That sounds like a great name." So this is what we call fanciful mark in trademark law. High level of enforceability. Okay. On the other side of this would be I've got a new I've got a new soap. Okay, what are you going to call it? I call it soap. Trademark office will not allow it. And you can see why. If I get to call my soap soap, you guys don't get to call your soap soap. It's very problematic. I've just taken a word out of the lexicon. No, it's not going to happen. What if I call it bubbly? Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Because now it's suggestive. Okay, and if it creates a lot of bubbles, it's even a little descriptive. It's not going to be, it's not going to be as, easy, as easy to force as Zanga soap. Okay, but at least I, I, I can register that, or try to register that with a straight face. So it goes, I probably have it somewhere here, probably on the next page. Or not. Yeah, under major problems, identifying the mark in the URL. It was fanciful, suggestive, kind of suggests you what's going on. Believe it or not, the people at Google thought Google was suggestive of search because of the Goog and the big sense. number and all that kind of stuff. Right. I was going to ask that. It's a derivative of a dictionary entry. It's a derivative of a order of magnitude. Right. Right. Like billion, zillion. Uh, it's. Called, anybody know what the order of magnitude is? Huh? Ten to the hundred. Yeah, but what's it called? It's called Google Docs. No, it's called something slightly it's different. After the show. <laughs> you and me. Um, so it's, it, they thought it was, you know, suggestive. It certainly wasn't descriptive, and I, I, I'm not even sure it would be suggestive, because like the fact that you have an extraordinarily large number with the fact that it searches a lot of pages, it's it's pretty much on the fanciful border. Um, and then descriptive, generic, forget about it. You're not going to be able to do it. Sometimes, and you've heard a lot about this, a mark can become generic. Uh, Kleenex had to fight very hard to make sure that people were using tissue paper, not. Kleenex to wipe their nose. Because if everybody says, hey, that's Kleenex, no matter what it is, it falls into generification. 
most of you won't actually bump up against that. But I like trademarks. I like trademarks a lot. I like trademarks because A, if you get one, they're really broad. So let's say I'm selling it's an iPhone app, right? And what it does is Uber would be an example. So I have Uber, right? I'm going to file in what's called in a bunch of different international classes. And I'm going to say, well, it's a computer, right? It's a computer system, it's a software system. That's one class of goods and services. I'm also going to say, you know what? This is also a service for vehicle delivery or, or for passenger transportation, right? Okay, so that's sort of a different class. Trademark law looks at these things very broad. So if you're doing anything remotely near that class, uh, and I'm making this up on the fly, so let's see if I can do a good one. If you had a taxi service right now, and it was called Uber, no mobile phones, nothing like that, but Uber already had a trademark registration in that area, you'd be infringing. It's, it's a terribly broad thing. Where I, what I get all the time is this, is uh, I have a client, and what they do is a database algorithm that searches databases in real time to do quantified data. So we're in software. And then it's somebody who has software, but for a completely different thing, a software that helps scheduling HR appointments. Well, with the trademark office, chances are it's all under one umbrella in one class. And so it's seen very much as being in your field. Now, when it gets actually into litigation, they'll have some defenses and the defense goes, look, nobody would ever confuse us. But that's not the point. The point, because you're small and you don't want to go to court, is to get somebody else to stop quickly with a minimum of expense. So what you do is you have your lawyers drive a cease and desist letter that says, listen, I have the registration for Uber. Here's the registration. Put it on the appendix. It shows this very broad category. Okay, and maybe you cite a couple of cases showing how incredibly broad it is. I need you to cease and desist immediately and confirm with me. Okay, and now I have an actual application, which I attach, which says the federal government is behind me. I have the presumption that I, in fact, have a enforceable trademark, which means you have the burden of showing to everybody that you're not. I don't have to prove the case nearly as much as you do because I already have this presumption. It, it's a really great tool to have in your quiver, okay? And as we saw before, the trademark, the fact that you can trademark the quality of your CPU, a okay, CPU for goodness sakes, shipped inside a computer, is probably, in that case, as important as the functionality and capacity of that piece of computer hardware. Controlling the name can be, as powerful as having, or more powerful, especially for a company that doesn't have umpteen millions of dollars to spend on litigation, for actually making sure that you've got free sailing in your competitive market space. I want to stop there for a second. Just make sure everybody, that, that if there's any questions about that at all. So I've been a company, and they had a trademark on there, on the name Just Fab. Um, what's, it, what's the name? It was Just Fab. Just Fab. Just Fab is a monthly subscription uh, social commerce company for women, women mm -hmm. and men. Mm -hmm. So I was running the search campaigns, and I asked the general counsel there, is the TM, I'm, putting, I'm running an ad copy, I'm putting it in an ad copy, uh, trademark, official site, that kind of thing. When can I put a registration mark next to it? So I don't do that yet. Oh, why? Cause you we're, really, we're, really we're should not do it yet. For now. Well, what, what good is that? And well, it kind of puts everyone on notice, but it's not official yet. So, I'm, why isn't registration on there? Is that the same thing, or? Mm -mm, but it's a really good question. Because like, just as in copyright, the notice gives you statutory damages. Um, it also gives you, what I just talked about, the presumption. It, it, it gives you a strong position of putting the infringer uh, in, in the unfortunate place of having to prove their case that you know, nobody would possibly be confused. And they don't have an, as much of an argument to say, I had no idea that this was being used as a trademark. A TM is a placeholder, okay? It says either I haven't gotten a registered trademark yet, or I'm not going to, but I still consider this my trademark. And that's literally what it's doing. It's kind of weird, frankly. 
I mean, I think most of us know when somebody's using their corporate name or their product name as a trademark, okay? But especially in the 70s and 80s, if you looked at a lot of marketing, actually any decade before recently, you know, it was really kind of hard to actually tell to a certain degree what, they, what a company might really consider its trademark, okay? What happened was, especially with the internet, is some people just said, you know, this is screwy, I can't, I can't have 47 trademarks. Amazon was actually one of the leaders in saying, I'm not gonna have the Amazon system this and the Amazon, it's just Amazon, okay? Amazon Bookstore, we're not gonna call it the Amazon Jungle Bookstore. No, it's Amazon Bookstore. And they, they relied on one mark. They've, they've increased that a little bit, but not much. They're just keeping one mark as much as they can, okay? Also, if you have Amazon Cloud Services, there's a little bit of a problem. If I try and trademark Amazon Cloud Services, what's the problem? It is fanciful, descriptive, suggestive. Where does it, where does M, forget, let's take the Amazon out of Amazon Cloud Services, okay? It's descriptive. Descriptive. Or generic, depending, but forget about it. You're never gonna, and what you'll see is, you'll see somebody, when they register, they'll, say, they'll actually register Amazon Cloud Services, but you'll see in the application that they've actually stated that they have no ownership rights to the part that is descriptive or generic. I mean, they, like Beats by Dr. Dre, if I'm not wrong, he's actually in that application said, I can't own Beats. I can own Dr. Dre and I can own Beats by Dr. Dre, but I can't just own Beats by this registration because that's become descriptive or too many people are already using it, or generic. So use the trademark to say, hey look guys, I'm meaning this is a trademark. As soon as you get the registered federal trademark, yeah. then you put the R on it. Then you want a lot of marketing material. You don't have, it, it's... Well, not all, but you have to show that the real owners of this are Yeah, that, at that point you want to go through it with a lawyer, because it's really tricky and not a lot of people agree. But you want it to be prominent enough in your materials and online and mobile app prominent enough that somebody would be on notice that you've actually got a registered trademark. And if you actually see, uh, you know, you take, what's funny is the big guys actually, whether it's Google, Facebook, what have you, they do it less than what they should be doing. I think they're less worried because somebody's going to have to show that they thought, yeah, I could use Facebook. I didn't, I didn't you know, on the home page, on the big one, I, on the bottom I saw when you go to terms of service, but on the home page, who knew? Who knew that they were using terms? I didn't know that. It's a hard argument to say that I had no idea that that was their main trademark or that they didn't register it. See my point? So I think they're being, don't, don't follow them too closely when you're smaller. Smaller, try and do it a little bit more. And those are the only two for trademark. While we're on the subject though, let's talk about other ones. Patents. Anybody seen a patent pending? Patent pending is I filed a patent application, but I haven't gotten a patent, okay? P with a circle, I got the actual patent. A design patent actually has a different one, not surprisingly, it's just design patent. Copyright, you guys know about. Anything else on notice requirements? Okay. Um, ah, one thing that's really neat about trademarks is it's relatively easy to figure out infringement. I mean, I could sit here and talk about a bunch of cases where we weren't sure about it, like the AMD versus Intel. Again, the legal community was all over, wasn't really sure about the status or what, that, what the real answer was. That's the outlier case. Most cases are like one of my favorite ones from law school, Johnny Carson versus here's Johnny Toilets. So Johnny Carson was a uh, TV show host and he had a famous thing when he came out, you know, the guy would go, here's Johnny's, one of the most famous lines in the United States. And not surprisingly, uh, there's a company, I believe it was in Florida, had, here's Johnny Toilets. And that was how their TV ads went. Here's Johnny Toilets, 30 seconds of Johnny Toilets. You don't have to read that case to actually know who won, right? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. And I think in most trademark, most times when a client brings a trademark matter to me, it's pretty clear about whether or not somebody's infringing their mark or we're infringing somebody else's. It's pretty straightforward. Um, because, and, and, and what you look for is you look for similarity. But what you ask yourself is the same thing a court would ask of the jury. Would a consumer is there a reasonable likelihood of confusion between these two marks, okay? And what will happen is we'll actually bring experts in 
if, if it makes sense to say, well, you know, we actually did a survey. And in our survey, we found that, you know, we did this and this, and we found 72% of the people couldn't, wouldn't, didn't know the difference between these two. They were, they were so substantially similar, they thought they were looking at the same thing. All right? Um, it's, it's not necessarily how it looks, it's literally how it looks in context. So if it's a soup can, if you're at the grocery store, right? If it's online, it's wherever you would buy, if it's an e-commerce, how you would see it online. And it's not you. Other consumers would do it. Now a lot of times what you have is actual data, why? Because somebody bought a product and they're calling the competitor's helpline, so, you know, customer support line, saying, hey look, I bought your product and it's not working. You know, it's not my product. Well, yeah, it is. It's called the so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, you know, and you bring this, uh, enough of these to a court, and the court goes, well, it isn't that there's a substantial likelihood of confusion. There's customer confusion here. You're infringing. Does it make sense, though? So what happens when Andy Warhol makes a silk screen of a Campbell's soup can? Great question. What do you think, out of curiosity? Well, on the one hand, there's no confusing that that's a can of soup, but it is their look, their you know, their design, their everything else. Right. <clears throat> Under the first, and then the most basic tenets of trademark law, exactly you got to the right conclusion. There's not going to be, there's no customer confusion. Nobody's going to accidentally walk into a gallery, buy a Warhol painting, and, and thinking that they were going to get a can of soup, and vice versa. Nobody's going to, right? So that's not going to happen. There is something called dilution of famous marks, which is that, um, and there's a lot of, always been a lot of critics about this area of what's called the Latham Act. But basically, if a mark gets so famous, even though there wouldn't be customer confusion, um, somebody's using that name and it sort of dilutes the goodwill associated with that mark. Okay? So if I start, you know, I'm trying to think of a really good example here. I just hate these cases so much. I just hate these cases so much. It, so Mickey Mouse is, oh, I know. No, yeah, you start a space exploration company called Mickey Mouse. Right, space exploration. Now, Walt Disney's never been in space exploration. Maybe it has, I'm wrong about that. Okay, but you go, look, there's no customer confusion. Everybody that sends satellites to space, okay, it isn't like they're going, oh, look, you know, for Walt Disney, there's no customer confusion here. It's a very sophisticated audience, consumers. Okay, but there's an argument that, look, I've spent 100 years building this brand, and you're diluting it. Okay, what if everybody that does something that isn't exactly what we do has a Mickey Mouse this or a Mickey Mouse that? You know, or Cadillac this or Cadillac that. Cadillac actually was somebody who sued a lot of, around a lot of people trying to do um, dilution. Uh, so, and, and actually there's a piece of law that does protect them. It's quite involved. You, you might understand why. The other question though is, uh, is there a copyright infringement, right? Somebody actually had to actually paint that can. Warhol had to copy it. Is it substantial? I think it's pretty substantial. For both the trademark and the copyright infringement claim there, you'd have a very good argument for fair use. And, and a fair use normally has to be that you're not taking too much of it. And it's for mainly, it's, there's actually 16 different elements. Um, but what, what happens is courts look at all these different elements, including are you using it for a commercial purpose? Are you hurting the original market? In other words, you know, is Campbell actually getting hurt? In, in their sales because of this? Um, or are they selling Campbell's soup paintings as well? Okay, they're not, so there's not much. So look at these 16 points, honestly, when you look at all these cases, what it is the, the court or the jury comes to a gestalt about whether or not you ought to be seen as an infringer. And if they think you shouldn't be, like Warhol well, shouldn't be here, right? I mean, that's your gut instinct. They go through the elements and they pretty much say, you know, on this one, it's a fair use. You brought up an interesting point. So then could Campbell's have taken pictures of their own soup can and made posters and said, and made Absolutely. posters like Warhols and no. said. They did though. Campbell did? Yeah, Campbell put out the Warhol soup can. With Warhol's license. Oh. That's a really good question, but the answer is probably no. So now you're in the same marketplace and you have substantial copy and substantial similarity. Adam, Isn't that crazy? Can you talk just a little bit about fair use in terms of uh, video? Like 
God, I hope not. Yes. Well, for example. Yeah. No, it's a bit, it's a terribly complicated area in terms of being having any predictability. Go ahead. Well, for those of you who don't know, I, I cut together a video illustrating a game plan for my company to essentially uh, show people what we do. And I used, I don't know, one, two, half second clips from various videos to run YouTube. And I want to know where that stands in terms of their use. Sure. So, and again, and you know this one then, but I, it's not legal advice, right? Because in order for me to actually have an opinion, I take a look at a lot of facts, I take a look, or any lawyer, hopefully, you take a look at a lot of what's going on, you see whether or not there's any recent cases on the topic, that sort of thing. But let's just work with this, because uh, in other words, what he's doing is he's got these pieces of videotape, and they express an idea. An idea. Collectively, they express a different idea than they do separately. Right. In this case, being sports, yes. uh, adventure. The so, so as I said, there's a lot of elements. Okay, the ones that really tend to be triggers out of all these elements is one: Are you somehow usurping the the author's commercial value of the work? So, if he took pieces of work belonging to whoever it was that made them, and they normally license them and make money off of it. Okay, that would be a real problem. So in Corbis, when you take something from Corbis, no matter what you do with it, just about, they've got a really good argument that you're hurting their business, because that is their business. That is what they're set up to do. I don't know if it, is it, who doesn't know about Corbis? What's Corbis? Corbis is, it's like Hearst Images. Yeah. It's uh, imaging, you go buy uh, pictures. What's on my website? Images. So, uh, sorry, uh, for some reason I thought everybody was familiar. But the point is, if, if, if that's their business or if they have business in licensing, sure. that's number one. Two is, what would help you is if, in, it, you know, I can take an image, right, and I can use it to express my own idea, okay? Or I can take that image and I can talk about that image. I can say, you see what he's doing on this adventure? You see what Bob's doing? I have to tell you, I'm very impressed with this for the following reasons. Right. And in your blog, you say, well, these are the reasons I'm impressed with what Bob did, Bob did in this piece of video. That second one has a much, much, much stronger fair use exception. Because what you're doing is commenting on what you're taking. Right, okay. Okay? The other thing that will, if it's political, that greatly enhances it. If it is part of, uh, if it's a strong news item, okay, and, it, and you haven't taken too much, and too much gets litigated all the time. Because you're not supposed to, if you aren't doing a fair use, you're not supposed to take any more than is necessary for the purpose. Well, how do you figure that out? You don't figure, I mean, a jury figures it out a year later, right? But, and it's it, very hard to predict what, what it's going to be. These tend to be the main elements, all right? What I always like to tell clients, especially in trademark and copyright, especially in trademark, before I even look at who owns what, and you know, and the, exactly how they have it registered and whether or not they have it marked, I ask, who is going to sue you? Who are you worried about? If they say Walt Disney, I say, cut it out. Because Walt Disney will come after you like a zombie apocalypse. I am not joking. They are, and they do this on purpose to, because every lawyer knows, every lawyer dealing with this knows you do not with Disney. They will slam you into the ground and stomp on your head just so they can take pictures and show it online and say this is what happens if you infringe on Minnie Mouse, Mickey Mouse. <laughs> no joke. And I don't even care if they actually own the intellectual property. I don't care if there's holes in their arguments. I don't care. Get rid of it. Because you are going to be a target and a sitting duck and they will stomp on your head and you will have nothing but pain and agony. And they will do it in a way that is probably more than what is needed to solve their problem because they want to make sure that people like me tell people like you, cut it out, okay? I had a client, true story, I had a client called D5, leader in its field. Um, what they did was media streaming. Um, so the technology that allowed, let's say a DVD player, back when people, the DVD player to stream something over to the TV or stream over the internet. And they were called D5. Completely arbitrary name, it was because of the guy, it was his fifth company and he was like D5, great. Turned out there was another company that had a registered trademark, D5. 
So we never registered for the trademark. And I said, guys, you know, uh, they have a tra registered trademark. You do not, okay? What field are they in? So I check into it. Guess what they do? Anybody want to guess? Streaming technology. And I'm saying this is a complete accident. It's bizarre. I mean, there's, there, at this point, there wasn't like a billion of these companies doing this. But they were doing it. They were over in Indiana. We were in California. But, you know, the Internet's there. All it takes is a few keystrokes to find each other. And the CEO said, you know what? We're already D5. We're already D5. What are we going to do? You know, if we get a letter from them, we get a letter from them. And, and the truth is, we never got a letter from them. We sold the company before anything ever happened. And so you stop and you go, who wants to sue you? If it's a small company in Indiana, maybe that's a threshold of risk you want to take. See what I'm saying? So it's, uh, and, and I'm sorry for not being able to dig. No, that's uh, when, when it comes to uh, fair use, it's always nice if when you're taking somebody else's stuff, you look like making them look awesome, right? Um, it helps you uh, not fail in your fair use argument. Uh, and where I want to, oops, sorry. And I know this isn't PowerPoint. In fact, I don't know what it is. There we go. Design patents. Just uh, let me let me stop for a second. Any questions generally? Anything else? Just really quick, Adam. This is yeah. Interesting. Earlier, I mean, you said it really fast. What you really need is a marketing strategy covered by intellectual property. Right. So. Does that mean if I have a processor and I call it a court to do, that's more important than the actual technology? That it can be. The best technology does not always win. Is iCloud the very best cloud service? In terms of how much it gives you for free? For that matter, is Dropbox? What exactly did you mean? I mean don't get me wrong, these are extremely fantastic, awesome technologies. Sure. But very often, the reason why you win isn't because you waited a year until your patent got through. It's because you said, this is what the market needs to hear. This is what I'll be speaking to. Now, how can I protect that position? And very often, because you're going to be going to market <clears throat> very swiftly or changing or pivoting, you know, something like patent applications, what have you, is something to have, but it can't be the core of your intellectual property protection for the next three, four years. It's going to be more trademark. It's going to be to a certain degree copyright. It's going to be contra you know, contractual rights with your partners. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. You talking about licensing? Yes. Yeah. Oh, am I? Yeah. Probably not. A little, maybe. I'll answer, I'll answer questions. Let me get through on licensing, see where you want me to go. Yeah. And this is a little tough for me because in my head I'm editing so much, as you can probably tell. This is, if you're in law school, this is about a year and a half of classes. <laughs> um, unless you're taking a summary class, in which case it's only one semester. The uh, design patent, the reason I really want to talk about this is because probably it's the thing that nobody hears a lot about. Um, again, I graduated from graduate school. There was all this litigation, and I had written my graduate thesis, actually, on the problems of tra trade secrets, copyrights, trademarks, and patents in protecting graphical user interface elements. Because so I was watching this piece of litigation, another piece of litigation around the country go, and also how Europe was doing. And I thought, you know, what about design patents? Well, that was a pretty cool idea. And I'll explain why. Nothing. Dead air. I mean, you know, we literally, you'd literally talk to patent attorneys and they really would go, eh, design patents. And by the way, patent attorneys are usually the weird guy, and I love patent attorneys for anybody listening on video. But, you know, they're usually, it's like the R&D department. It's those kind of nerdy guys. They actually have engineering degrees and, you know, they do that law over there. But for them, it was like even this thing that's even left banky, nerdy kind of out there thing that we don't really get involved in. I heard somebody, there's a law firm in Milwaukee that does them. It, it just was not commonplace at all. Suddenly, um, really only three years ago, four years ago, we started to see the numbers come up for this. And, and by the way, the, there still was, if anything, there was still not good, there were not effective ways of protecting um, graphical user uh, design elements of whatever the product or services, okay? It just it wasn't out there. Um, so design, design patents, I think one of the reasons why they weren't popular is because they didn't make any sense given the name. It sounds like it's a patent. And by the way, you go to the same place, the Patent and Trademark Office, you go to get your regular patent, right? And it has some of the same language. 
it is so incredibly dissimilar to a patent. It's really, if anything, it's kind of close to a copyright with a smidgen of trademark. What do I mean? First of all, one of the limitations of copyright, as I said before, is it can't be, you can't copyright a function. Okay, if something's purely functional, you can't copyright. How far does that go? If I write an algorithm, I can't copyright it. That, that algorithm, unless it is massive, and the person copies it identically and completely, you're not going to be able to copyright it because it's the expression of a mathematical idea, more or less, and a process the computer's going to go through. You may, may, may be able to get a patent on it, but you, it's not going to get copyright protection. All right? Copyright has in its thing, this is for artistic works, this is not for functional works. How far does this go? If I make a sculpture, there used to be an incredibly interesting sculpture right here where they moved it into the garage. You can get copyright protection over that. Second year, done with their sculpture. Boom, it's copyright. I got a copyright. It's my sculpture. Uh, one of my favorite cases in copyright law was there was a company that made mannequins. Gorgeous mannequins. Honest to God, I've seen these, these examples. They're beautiful. They're like sculptural works. And they sold them as mannequins. Lo and behold, somebody took the mannequins, made a mold of them, started making identical mannequins, started selling them. Beautiful mannequins, complete copies. Looked like a slam dunk cake of infringement of these beautiful sculptures. In fact, one of the mannequins, even before the litigation started, was featured at the New York Museum of Modern Art. This was a beautiful mannequin. This was a sculptural piece of work. So the court said, no, sorry, you have no copyright on this. And the reason you have no copyright on this is we believe that there's something called functional merger. The function and the form of your artistic expression have become one. I can't, I can't pull them apart, okay? If you paint it on the mannequin, maybe, right? You painted flowers, because how is the flowers functional? Unless they somehow work. But, but the actual shape is, yeah, it's gorgeous, but it's a functional thing. And the same, even though that case, I think, was in the early 70s, that notion continues from software and everything else. So how do we protect design elements of a functional item? You can't do it in copyright. What you can do is you can do it in, with a design patent. What you literally do is you have a drawing, or more than one, and it depicts what you're trying to protect visually. You put it into an application which says, by the way, here's a drawing. It's pretty much what your application says. You give it to the patent office. Remember how I said over 90% of the regular patents, the first thing you get after two, three years is a letter saying, we reject this. 84% of all the design patent applications, after 16 to 18, 24 months, you get a letter saying, here's your patent. It costs a fifth of what this costs, right? maybe two, $3,000, depending on what you're doing. And by the way, now you've got the word patent next to your design. And you have many of the protections in terms of breadth and strength of having a regular patent, but it's on the design. And the fact that just because the design has, look, I mean, if it's a good example, and I'll show it to you in a second, is Samsung versus Apple. Apple had these design, design patents. Now granted, this phone, look, I mean, the bevel, the edges I'm holding, it has some functional aspect to it, right? The, the amount of the width and this and that, there's functional aspects, right? But they still could protect them because they weren't necessary for the phone to operate. They were just the way that they approached the industrial design. It became a very powerful thing, so it's easy to get. It's cheap, it's a hell of a lot cheaper than a patent. It's a hell of a lot faster to get. There's very little chance that the patent office is going to say, slow down, buddy, it's not novel. By the way, it's obvious. They don't say that. Generally speaking, 84% of the time, or less, or more, they say, here it is, right? That you just get it. Um, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll show a little bit to you. The standard for infringement is also a little bit interesting, which is, um, in patents, incredibly complicated. In copyright, it's, it, did the person copy it? Okay. Did they actually copy your design, and is it substantially similar? Okay. If you did not copy my design, even if it's identical, there's no copyright infringement. That seems unlikely, but this happens in Hollywood all the time, although people don't believe it. You know, I write a screenplay, 5,000 other people write a screenplay, lo and behold, there are some very, very incredible similarities. Well, the question becomes, did they, is there any way that they would have had access to it? 
Was it actually copied? Because if they could not have been copied, if they had no access, there's no infringement. It doesn't matter how similar they are. All right? Does that, first of all, make sense? Patents, it doesn't matter. And now we're talking about a design patent. So you never have to prove, you have to never have to go through the ordeal that somebody copied your design intentionally or that they had access to your design or even that you yourself had a product with that design. <clears throat> Let's say you didn't manufacture it or you stopped manufacturing it. If you've got the patent, it's similar enough, then they're an infringer. And the standard is kind of interesting because it's a combination of copyright and trademark. One is, and I'm trying to remember because we just got a little bit more clarity on it. <clears throat> Substantial identity and appearance found by the ordinary observer conducted in light of the prior art. What does that mean? It means that, well, let me show you actually what it means. I want to go up before Samsung, before we get technical. Sorry. Okay, see these uh, park benches? Let me show you the first case. Over here, can people see this by the way? From way back when? Okay. Here's the design pattern. Remember when I said it was simple? It's so simple. They took this, they put an application, sent it to the application, boom. This is the design, okay? The prior art is what existed before this. Okay, it turned out that there were park benches that look kind of similar, not the same, kind of similar. All right, so what I get is I kind of get this in light of that, right? I can't possibly, if somebody makes this, they're not gonna be an infringer, right? Because that predated what I invented. This was the defendant. This was held to infringe this despite this prior art. Once they had that under the belt, they went after this guy. And yes, believe it or not, this is different. Prior art, yes, Ben. Court decided this was non infringing in light of prior art, as determined by an ordinary observer looking for substantial identity. Now, you might say, this is terrible. Intellectually, I'm, I feel violated. You know, my, 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 this is, this, yes, but as a startup company, think about what this gives you. Okay? If you get one of these, and I'm representing this guy, right? So now you and your lawyer say, hey, look, you know, this, this guy's infringing. Can you send him a cease and desist letter? Okay, your lawyer does. I hope you don't mind being the lawyer. Sends it to me. I'm his lawyer. I get a look at this letter. Rick and I are sitting down. Rick goes, well, can you tell me whether or not I'm infringing? I go, I have no idea. Are you kidding me? Look at this case law. Okay, I don't know if you're infringing. It's scary as hell, right? In a weird way, that ambiguity can give you a broader, more power, right? I mean, because it would be very, very difficult for an attorney to give his client any kind of opinion that his client is not infringing. And what you might do, if you're the recipient of that letter, rather than get tangled up in a patent law case over design, which is scary as hell because it has the word patent in it, is maybe change your design a bit more so that you're no longer infringing, uh, potentially infringing. Does that make sense? I want it before we leave this and open up to licensing questions or any other questions. I want to show you the, <clears throat> again, Bruce Sewell, the guy who uh, was my boss during that first year of litigation is now the general counsel of Apple, and so was the general counsel during these cases, which was the Samsung-Apple wars, which are still going on. And although Apple and Samsung both asserted actual patents, okay, regular patents, we're gonna follow up, the design patents really came into vogue and into people's minds. And by the way, Apple won in the United States in, in the California court, in the federal court that's in California. Here's the prior art. Apple says, this is prior art. This came before us. This is what Apple got a design patent on. This is the 
This is Samsung Galaxy. Prior art. Apple patent. Samsung Galaxy. This goes on also into the phones. Held infringing. As substantially similar to this in light of that. So what do you do? I mean, the point is, this is a good thing to have. Cost three, four, five thousand dollars maybe to get. It protects your 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 design. If you have a new way, I mean, if you have, and I hate to say it, but you know, a, a WordPress template kicks ass, right? And you, even if you see some prior art that comes close to it, you really think it kicks ass? Might it be worth a few thousand dollars to actually go try and get one of these things? I think it might, right? Especially because you're going to have an almost impossible time protecting what you have under copyright. And the only thing that's going to be protected in a trademark is an actual slogan or logo, if you get that. And by the way, it will be at least as expensive to go get. It should also obviously protect your trademark. So I think for people, especially in visual, that have visual design elements of whatever product or servicing, service they have, you really need to look at design patterns seriously. But I think until we open it for questions, yeah. Well, we'll go to question one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that question. Um, suppose you uh, you have a company that provides software as a service, and it's a black box. Nobody outside the company knows how it works. You have a competitor that suspects maybe they're infringing, but how do they prove it if they don't know how it works? What can they do? Infringing what? On their patent. Well, what can that, uh, the, the, the patent holder do? Right. right. Yeah, they, I mean, sort of opening the box. They can't prove you're infringing. Can they force you out of the box? Oh no! Um, look, what they what they would do if they felt they had enough evidence is they would file a patent infringement case, right? I mean, they might try to scare you first. If the court felt that they did not have an information enough information to base their opinion on, they simply throw it. Out. You know, the, you, it would get the defendant's attorneys would get dismissed, uh, and, and you know, it's obviously called. Uh, you hear it in different forms, it's called a fishing expedition. It's like, well, it seems to do similar, similar things. But. So if they convince the court that if there's enough evidence that it might be infringing, then they force you open the box? The court force they you open the box? Okay. Now, what they might do, though, is they might do it in a, uh, under a protective order. Mm -hmm. So that only a very limited number of people who are experts can actually examine it. Um, and that you don't, so that you don't lose your trade secret rights and your competitive position because of how that thing works. Does that help? Yep. The other stuff? Yeah. So you're saying you can't patent the functionality. So an algorithm, for example, a recommendation in your Copyright. Oh, copyright. Okay. Okay. At what point in the technology development process do you recommend filing? Depends on the technology and how much money you have. Pardon? Depends on the technology and how much money you have. I mean, I hate to be that open. So some, uh, I think you might have stepped away, but if, if you're doing, you know, uh, uh, you know, what he's trying to do in terms of video connected to audio and streaming, it might be quite a bit earlier because um, you want to see if you have, to have any kind of protectable position because that's actually a space where there's been a lot of technology. Um, I can guarantee that any company that's doing something like that is arguably infringing. And a lot of times I have clients and they'll, they'll run and they'll go, oh, I just heard about this patent, I'm worried we're infringing. Well, you don't worry, you're infringing probably 100 other people's patents. I know it's a terrible thing, but it's, there, there's no way to actually figure that out inexpensively. So if you're in a highly technical environment where there's a lot of competition and other patents in there, um, investors are going to usually want to see that you actually have something that's protectable you know in in your field and a prior art search and a patent application will actually help you discover that quite a bit um, otherwise it's a very expensive thing what a lot of people do is they take a cheaper more immediate way to go uh, especially before you launch whatever it is product or service is to file what's called a provisional patent provisional patent is not a patent it's not even really what it is is a placeholder. You disclose what you think is your invention. You may not do it with all the thoroughness of a regular patent, but it puts a one-year placeholder 
in there. It doesn't get published, it doesn't get reviewed, but for one year, if you decide to actually uh, file a patent, a full patent, you can rely on that priority date of that provisional patent um, as long as the invention that you end up applying for, um, what, you have, the, what you submitted as materials is sufficient to support that application. So it can't be, well, you know, I put in a quarter of the stuff and now I'm going to go with the full patent, but I want the date over here. No, no, no. It has to be disclosed over here if okay. you want that priority mm -hmm. date. And that's a lot cheaper because if there's no review, uh, an attorney isn't going to spend as much time on that. Okay. And another question, I guess, following that, at what point do you have licensing rights over your own, or your, do you have data rights? At what point do you have licensing rights? What kind of product or service? All kinds of technology? Types? Almost immediately. Almost immediately. The reason is, is um, the way you think of a license is a license is a right not to be an infringer. Mm -hmm. So, you, you, most intellectual, uh, we talk about copyright, how soon copyright exists. It is the moment you put pen to paper and come up with an original expression fixed in the tangible medium. Boom. The whole registration I said about all that and blah, 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 that's for statutory damages. Okay, but as soon as you do that, you have a copyright. As soon as you have, so as soon as you've written that, you can license, there's something to license, right? Trade secret, as soon as you have something of commercial value that is secret, you have something to license. Um, with a, even in a, in a patent application, uh, it, the license has to be crafted differently, but as soon as you, you have the beginnings of rights, you know, so even though you can't sue somebody for infringement, the license becomes sort of a placeholder for what might arise with that patent application if it gets finally awarded. Trademarks, we talked about a little bit about a trademark application, right? Just a little bit, we didn't talk about But you don't need a trademark application in order to have a trademark, an enforceable trademark, okay? If you are, somebody give me the name of your company. Bisbo. Bisbo? Bisbo. Oh, Bisbo. Okay. Let's assume that Bisbo, there's only one in what Bisbo does. He starts using it in marketing materials. Boom. He's got a trademark. Okay. That trademark, it might be geographically constrained to the area that he's actually commercializing his product or service. Right? But he's got a trademark. And he'll be able to defend that trademark. In fact, if Another company three years from now goes to the federal government, right, to the Patent and Trademark Office, says, I want a trademark on Bismo. Or Bisbo. Bisbo. Or Bisbo with a B-O. H-O-B-I-Z-B-O. Yeah, or Bisbo. They can actually get a federal trademark, but it's going to be limited in that they cannot crowd out his geography. Even though he doesn't have a federal trademark or a federal trademark registration. So he's got a licensing capability right away. Trademark licenses are a little bit different than copyright licenses, but he still has that right even though he doesn't have a federal registration. And now is that the same with, so how is it then with technology that you can patent license? If someone has a patent, if they don't have a patent or haven't applied for a patent, patent can, do they still have licensing rights to license the use of this? They do, but it's kind of like, what are you really licensing? Okay, at that point, um, you might have some trade secret, Right? Um, in most cases, the way that I would be crafting it mm -hmm. is that you're licensing this technology, capital T, and any patents that would be, that we file, cover that technology, right? So it's kind of nebulous, right? Okay, and if you're co But ultimately, what they're really getting as licensee until I develop those rights are gonna be the trade secret rights for that okay. invention. If you're co-developing that technology, Oh, that and that's wrong. Right, if you're doing that, and one co company A is developing one portion of the technology, and company B is developing another portion of the technology, but it operates together, would there be mutual licensing that would go on? No, I mean, yes because and no. different parts of the technology. So first of all, there's a default. The default is you guys don't like writing anything down. Okay. The, let's say the, the, you guys don't like writing anything down. Just, you're, you're not into it. So what happens? You both become joint inventors and joint authors, and you have mutual rights to the technology, including to a certain degree, a right to share 
royalties, a right, to share, a right to royalties. Um, but what most people do, because the whole thing's a huge quagmire, if you leave it that way, is you have a joint venture or joint development agreement that says who owns what rights, whether or not you have to commercialize those rights. If I get royalties based on this invention or, uh, or, or authorship, whether or not I need to pay you any amount of that, or whether or not we just share what we independently develop as a business. Does that make sense? Yeah. And anything else I can say like I've exhausted my time. So. All right. Well, thank you guys. <laughs>